It happens. Schedules, kids, activities, hobbies, work. Weight and pressure, distraction and interruptions. Is there time? Will I make the time? The moon and the stars glistening against the void of the sky. Can I find the time to see the one who hung them there? Can I silence the noise to find him? To see his majesty? To return to his presence? You know, in any given day, we are bombarded by what must feel like a gazillion of things that we can fixate our minds upon. Our, our senses are, are overwhelmed as we experience far more in a day than we could ever focus on. And attention then, at its root, is filtering out all of those things, or some of those things, in order to attend to other things. The skill of withdrawing from everything to focus on other things that are worth and worthy of our attention. Now, we do it naturally, don't we? We do it subconsciously in many ways with millions of items from the outer order that are bombarding us and presenting to our senses. We must filter out some to notice any, and without selective interest, our experience would be utter chaos. It's what's capturing my attention and my interest is what's keeping me from noticing all other things, right? That when we focus on some things, we then are naturally not focused on other things. I want to talk about that a little bit as we step into Advent and begin to make our way towards Christmas. We're going to look into the first part of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at the story of the wise men coming from the east to visit Jesus and the manger is probably a familiar story to many. If not, it's a fantastic story to know. We're going to look at just the first couple of uh, verses, Matthew chapter 2. Have a Bible's with you. Love to have you open them up if you've got a device and that's what your pleasure is, and that's fantastic as well. I want you to see what we're seeing. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and this is what we find. This is what happened. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. Would you pray with me? Our gracious God, uh, our gracious Father, Father, may we hear the invitation that you give to us today. Father, would you put words on my lips as they tumble while they find fertile soil on our hearts and our souls that we might hear the invitation that you're making to each and every one of us. Father, it's to you we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. While the passage may be familiar and the wise men may be a group of fellows that we have heard some about and maybe are familiar with the fact that they're in the story, they're actually not that easy to identify. Christmas carols help us out not at all. You think about a carol like We Three Kings of Orient Art, it's a minor carol, but it's deeply flawed. First of all, the wise men are not kings, and beyond that, Matthew never tells us how many wise men or magi there are. Folks will assume there, there's three wise men because there's three gifts. Each gift has a wise man to carry it, right? That's what goes through our, our thinking. But it's more likely, it's probable that there were dozens of leaders, of soldiers, and of servants who were making their way from the east to Jerusalem. I want you to th think when, when we hear about the wise men coming from a distance, I want you to think about caravan traveling thousands of miles over foreign terrain with a priceless treasure, you can imagine a king would not send three wise men to do that, but would have sent an entire entourage to usher them in. And, and if you're still not sure if there's more than three or not, 
You, you might remember how they're received. We'll talk about this in the weeks coming. How they're received when they step into Jerusalem. We're told it created quite a stir. Three weather-worn, weary travelers don't make much commotion and don't make much of an impression. But a caravan of dozens of leaders and soldiers and servants, when they step into a city, people notice that. Wise men, um, some translations you might have magi. That might be a term that you're familiar with, a title you're refer, uh, familiar with. They actually would refer to a very specific group of people. At, at first, when that term was used in history, it was a very specific narrow group of people. It was a priestly caste in the Medes kingdom. Folks actually believed that that caste, that group of people, had special powers. Um, think about Daniel chapter 2. Maybe you're familiar with what happens in, Dan, in the book of Daniel where Israel is, uh, some of them are, uh, Israel is overthrown, some of them are brought to, um, to Babylon, and in Daniel chapter 2, we read this. The king, that would be Babylon, commanded that the magicians, there's our word, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. Now, you might remember, if you've read this, if it's new to you, you wouldn't remember this at all, right? That the king um, had a dream the night before, but he did not tell the magi or the wise men what the dream was. His opinion was, if you're the magi, if you're the wise men, if you have these superpowers, which we believe you to have, not only will you be able to interpret the dream, but you'll be able to read my mind. You would be able to know what my dream is without me having to tell you. And the fact that I'm not telling you proves that then you are wise men and magi. Well, over time, these magi began to, the term began to, to broaden. It refer to a larger group of folks. It covers a wider range of giftings, right? And, and I want you to think the magi, the wise men, were counselors to a king. They're his advisors. They're the people that a king would place around him to make wise and thoughtful decisions. They're folks that were interested in dreams. They were interested in astrology and astronomy. They actually paid attention to magic. And they read the books that held the deep mysteries of the universe. You see this, actually, when the Magi explained why they show up in Jerusalem. Verse 2. We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Clearly, there are astrologers and stargazers that would read the skies and they would associate importance and significance to what was happening in the stars. And they would go to the king and they would explain to the king why this is important. They saw his star. It meant something to him. It, it would be foolish to dismiss them as flaky palm readers if for no other reason than they got it right. What they saw, though, is a mystery. We don't really know. Verse 2 says they saw his, uh, that his star rose. If you look at verse 9, a little later on in the passage, it says this. After listening to the king, this is them talking to King Herod, they went on their way. And behold, the star that, had, that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. There's lots of ink that's been spilled through time trying to describe what exactly happened. What did the wise men actually see? Folks have argued in time whether uh, everything from supernovas to the alignment of planets to Halley's Comet screeching across the sky to just simple miraculous light in the sky. But no one really knows what exactly happened in the stars. Anytime you read scripture, it's not hard to be baffled. Over and over, our Bible baffles us with curiosity. When you think about this passage, how did this star get the Magi from the east to Jerusalem? How did the star go before them on their walk from Jerusalem to Bethlehem? How did the star stand over the place where the one born king of the Jews is? You know, when we read stories like this, and these are questions that are in our mind, they're not bad questions, they're actually good questions, they're just not the best questions. And if we get tripped up and don't go beyond these questions, then we miss out on the best questions that are available to us. But probably the better question than these are, how did what they saw lead them to seek the king of the Jews? Or maybe, what was it that made them think that this particular star was 
his star. We're going to get into that actually next week a little bit. But for today, whatever it was, it did. And I want to pull out two things. I think it tells us two things in this passage. It tells us a ton about our God, and it tells us a ton about the wise men. So I want to talk there. What's it tell us about our God? How, how has our God revealed himself in this passage? What do we discover about him, or what are we what are reminded of about him? Well, the first is this. When you read Scripture, there's only one person. There's one person in biblical thinking that can cause a star to do whatever it is that the star did. Stars don't do things on their own. The star was doing something it cannot do by itself. It was guiding the Magi to find the one born of the king of the Jews. It's not something stars can do by themselves. Matthew actually shows that God was influencing the stars, doesn't he? He was doing that to get foreign Magi to Bethlehem so that they can find Jesus. It makes me think about Job, first part of the book of Job, chapter 9. Job was talking with his friends and trying to understand their day. And this is what Job says, Job 9, verse 8 and following. It's speaking of God. God who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. He made the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. He does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number. Most translations actually begin that passage by talking about who hung the stars in the sky. We know that about our God, that he spoke and stars were hung in the sky. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, describing Jesus. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the power of his word. Matthew's telling us something about our God. If you skip to Luke, Luke doesn't tell the story of the Magi at all. He tells the story of how God influences the Roman Empire. Remember the census. And God has the Roman Empire call for a census at the exact time that was needed to get a virgin to Bethlehem. One of the things that we discover is our God is a God of intention, of deliberateness. He's a God who's willing to manipulate the skies to drive pagan wise men serving a pagan king to a lonely cattle stall to bow the knee to Jesus. Why don't you just sit in that for a minute? Pull on that a second. When you back up and you look at Matthew's gospel as a whole, the entire movement in Matthew's gospel, it's bookended with an intention and a focus on the nations. It begins with the wise men coming and seeing, right? They came and they saw. And it ends with what we call the Great Commission, the go and tell. See, the core of the gospel is that Jesus is not a Jewish king or an American savior. He's the savior of the world. Now, there's no hope for forgiveness of sins. There's no healing from brokenness and darkness in the world apart from him. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing God won't do for the world to know it. Including moving stars in the sky, including uh, uh, um, moving the Roman Empire to cause a census. It's like a child moving pieces on a game board for him. Have you ever considered that there's nothing God won't do to ensure that you can come to know him. Is this the God you know? Who considers you so precious, has such deep affection for you that he will move the heavens to bring you to him. That's what he did with the Magi. That's what he did with the wise men. Can you consider that he would do that for you too? Tells us something about our God, doesn't it? Also tells something about the wise men or the, or the magi. What's the moments tell us about them? Well, quite simply, they noticed. There's something that happened in the skies, and they noticed it. Now, I want you to keep in mind the, the time frame, right? It's the first century. It's pretty early on in the turn of the, of, of the calendar, right? The telescope wasn't, invoted, wasn't invented until 1609. Galileo and Kepler and Copernicus, it was centuries away from them being a twinkle in their parents' eye. And yet, 
They saw what they saw. They noticed what happened. Astronomy, if you know much about it, is, is a detail-oriented tasking experience. It requires great attention to detail. These, these wise men did pay attention to detail. How, how did that happen? How did they see this? Well, there's only one way, actually, to explain it, isn't there? They searched. They looked. They paid attention. You could argue they practiced selective interest. And what they, they looked and, what they, and look what they got for it. God invited them into the manger. Man, it must have been quite a moment for them. Now, here's the kicker, right? Wise men, they were pagans. They're not part of God's people. We don't know how much they even knew about Jesus' identity. I mean, did he know that he's the son of God? Did he know he's the second person of the Trinity? Did they know he was a long-awaited Savior? Had they read the promises? Had they heard the promises? Did they know he's the one who's going to come and sit on David's throne forever? Did they know he was the fulfillment of Isaiah's promise in Isaiah chapter 9, wonderful counselor, all that stuff? Did they know those things? They were pagans from a pagan land, and they noticed, and they came, and they honored him. They opened treasured boxes, and they brought out gifts because they were watching for the one born king of the Jews. How, how much more are we invited to be attentive when we know? We know who this Jesus is. We are part of God's people. We know he's the son of God. We know he's the second person of the Trinity. We know he is the long awaited Savior. We know he is the one, the king that came to sit on David's throne forever. We know these things. How much more are we invited to pay attention and to search and to look for him? And of course, we've been given the Holy Spirit, right? To have the ability to do that. How much more attentive are we to be when we know who he is? Think about Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. One of the most repeated sayings in the gospel actually shows up in that passage. It says this, when, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. It's an invitation from Jesus to his hearers. It's a call for spiritual wakefulness, to be attentive and alert, to, be, to have attention and to hear. Because the spiritually dull and the spiritually distracted can't and won't hear. The point, of course, is if we're not paying attention to what God is doing, we might miss what he's doing. And that's a costly miss. I don't know what your Advent normally looks like or Christmas season normally looks like. Don't know how it's filled. Don't know if your schedule picks up or slows down. My guess is if yours is in like mine, it picks up. I don't know what it's going to look like this year in COVID. What I do know is this. As we approach Christmas, I want to suggest to you that there's an opportunity being given to you, an opportunity being offered to you, an invitation perhaps to withdraw from some things to create space in order to be attentive to other things. What's your day look like? What do your days look like? Do you describe them as spiritually alert and attentive? How do you navigate with selective interest? And when you do, what do you select out? And what do you invite in? What do you need to withdraw from in your days? What things are bombarding your senses and demanding your attention that would keep you from seeing the one born king of the Jews? As we approach Christmas, and we look back across the season, wouldn't it be wonderful to look back and to say the selective interest allowed me to see the Lord move in my life in new and fantastic ways? Could that be the 
invitation our God is asking or giving to you today. Let's pray. Gracious Father, what a thing it is that you would move the heavens and the earth. What a thing it is that you would cause the Roman Empire to call for a census. All to accomplish your plans in our day and our lives. Father, I know not what you will do in my day and our days. But I do know the invitation you're asking or you're extending to us, Father. And I pray for us that we may have selective interest. That we may create space for you. And in creating space for you, we will not miss. Lord, would you make us a people that see and look. Seek and find. We ask, we pray all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.